appreciate the, the worship. Points us to the Savior. We're celebrating Him in these days. We think about the Chief Shepherd, the Great Shepherd, His under shepherds, and His sheep. Thank you, Jim. That was precious. And I'm preaching this afternoon. I've been assigned to an obscure text in the scripture. Psalm 23. I was telling my wife the other day, in fact, I told our congregation, I don't think I've, in all the years preaching, I don't think I've ever preached through Psalm 23. And, and Karen told me the next day, she said, because uh, she takes notes in her Bible. She said, actually, on March 29th, 2020, when our church head, headed into its COVID season, you preached on Psalm 23. So I thank God for a wife that keeps my notes. Today we're looking at this, how the chief shepherd cares for his flock. And I'm going to ask you to do something. We do this every week of the world at Bethel. I ask you to stand with me as I read this text. When I read the scriptures in preparation to preach at Bethel, I ask our people after I've read the text, what have we just read together? Their answer every week is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Follow along in your Bibles, if you would. It's the Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What have we just read together? We read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord bless the reading, the study of his word today, and strengthen us. Give us this confident uh, attitude about who he is, who we are because of him by grace through faith, and a contentment that attends that. Thank you. Please be seated. James Montgomery Boyce says millions of people have memorized this psalm, even those who have learned few other scripture portions. Ministers have used it to comfort people who are going through severe tri personal trials, suffering illness, or dying. For some, the words of this psalm have been the last they ever uttered in life. I suppose over uh, 45 years of pastoring, I've read this psalm hundreds of times as I've preached funeral after funeral after funeral. I read it as a part of a trio of psalms, the 23rd psalm, the 24th psalm, the 27th psalm. It is a psalm that has a significant tone to it. It's a tone of confident contentment. Philip Keller in his excellent book, A Shepherd, looks at the 23rd psalm, calls this David's hymn of praise in divine diligence. I hope today in the time we have together, we can see three things from this that will encourage us. See the Lord as the chief shepherd who sustains his people. See the Lord as the chief shepherd who leads his people. And see the Lord as the chief shepherd who provides for his people. Let's look at this together today. Attending passages that, that strengthen and serve as companions to this, you think of the 100th Psalm, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. That's what we're doing here. Know that the Lord, he is God, it is he who made us, and we are his, and then we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. It's not unusual in the scripture to see being the people of God, the children of God, and 
sheep of God to be intertwined. They're two of the prominent pictures that we have in the scripture of how Lord, the Lord relates to his people. Jim referenced John 10, where our Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He goes on and talks about in that 10th chapter, my sheep I hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. A preacher said years ago, he said the people of God ought to recognize those who are, who are followers of Jesus Christ that they're marked with a brand. And the brand is that of an ear and a foot. An ear because we, we hear the voice of the Lord. We attend to that. A foot because we follow him. We had a panel discussion last night and talked about superficial Christians, uh, false Christians. Uh, there are some marks. There are some marks of people who follow Christ. We obey you. Why would you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do the things I've commanded you. Commit and practice the things I've commanded you. And that's, that horrifying response in Matthew 7. When they say to him, in your name, we did these things. In your name. Teaching us, not everything done in the name of God is done to the glory of God. There's a lot of things done in the name of God that would tell us that it's what Christianity is about. And it, you look at it and realize it does not line up with the scriptures. So, you today, where are you? David says something here that's remarkable. He does not say, the Lord is a shepherd. The Lord is like a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Mine. Personal. Real. Rocky mentioned last night about people who say, I know the Lord, I know the Lord. But you know, the question in Scripture is, what evidence is there that the Lord knows you? Paul says that in Corinthians. Now that you know, rather, are known by God. We ask people, have you professed faith in Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus says in Matthew 7, I will profess, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who acted as if there was no law. We have it backwards, don't we? Upside down. Does Christ profess you? Does Christ know you? Have you accepted Christ? The question is, have you been accepted in the beloved? Has Christ accepted you? And so David makes this confident assertion here. The Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the covenant God is my shepherd. Interesting that it comes from a young boy who himself was a shepherd. Who told uh, King Saul when he happened upon that scene where Goliath is mocking God and mocking the armies of God. He said to King Saul in 1 Samuel 17, I've killed a bear and I've killed a lion. I'll dispatch this Philistine. So he knew what it was like to protect sheep, to care for sheep, to be responsible to those assigned. We also know, if you've ever read Philip Keller's excellent little book, that shepherding was the lowliest position. If you were in the household and your family happened to have sheep, it was usually the, the youngest son that would be assigned the responsibility of the sheep. The older sons, when they grew out of that, were happy that the youngest son now had to take that on. It was dirty work. It was nasty. Sheep are not the brightest animals in the world. They'll do things that if you've studied them, they amaze you. A pastor friend of mine who used to pastor uh, Providence Baptist Church in Ponca City owned sheep. And he and I would talk about his experience in handling and raising those sheep. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. He understood being a shepherd. He understood the Lord being his shepherd. And so he says in, a, in attending that, I shall not want. If you translate that in the Hebrew, it's I, I shall lack nothing that I need. I shall have lack of nothing that I need. And there is the, you, you blend right there in that statement, a confidence, the Lord is my shepherd. And the contentment, 
He provides everything that I need. Sometimes we get caught up in what we want. And it's important for us to recognize that the Lord is the one who will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. He knows what we need. He will not keep back from us anything that is good for us, for our lives and our godliness. But he doesn't always give us what we want because some of the things we want, if we got them, would be bad for us. So here's a, here's a shepherd, shepherd king. This psalm was probably written toward the end of David's life. He's, he's seen a lot of things. He's seen uh, his children violated by some of his own children. He's, he's seen a son uh, try to dethrone him. Uh, and yet he's confident as he makes his way to glory. I shall lack nothing that I need. He provides all that I need. Ecclesiastes speaks of the, the shepherd picture. He says his words to the wise are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Isaiah 40, one of my favorite passages in all the scripture, tells us that the Lord will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. One of the stories about shepherding in the, in the day that David lived was if a precocious lamb, a lamb that was, uh, was born and would not stay close to its, its mother, would not stay close to the flock, sometimes the shepherd would take that lamb, break his legs, carry him, close to his bosom, place him in the places where he needed to eat. And as the lamb grew and his, his legs healed, he would grow close to the shepherd. And by the time he could walk again, he would stay right by the shepherd. It was a tactic they used to keep them near. The Lord does that for us. He's done that for you. Done that for me, certainly, times in my life when I would have strayed. And the Lord brings the difficult providence a crippling providence, heightens my sensitivity, my awareness of my need and dependence on Him, my, my proneness to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. By the time He heals me, having me close to His heart, the heartbeat of the shepherd, He places you down. You follow Him. You draw near to Him. Jesus is portrayed as the, the good shepherd, in fact, 1 Peter 5, he's called the chief shepherd. The shepherd and overseer of our souls in 1 Peter 2, 25. Hebrews speaks of him as the great shepherd of the sheep. And so when David gives us this, he's telling us about his relationship to Yahweh. When we read it with new covenant eyes, we realize, yes, Jesus is our shepherd. He's our great shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. And so this is a very striking statement to open this psalm. And it sets the tone for the whole psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. Spurgeon says the sweetest word in the whole psalm is that monosyllable my. My, what a bold statement. What a comforting statement. So do you know the Lord that way today? A lot of people know about him. You may be in a church that talks a lot about him. Pastors who are faithful to, to preach about him, open the scripture and read about him. And that's all wonderful and what a blessing it is. But do you, do you personally know him? Do you know him? Can you say, he's my shepherd? I like to talk to people about the Lord and share the gospel with them and, and ask them. And I won't get into who, what particular group of religious people tend to say this, but I'll ask them things. So if you if you die today, where will you spend eternity? In heaven? I hope so. I don't know. According to this psalm, that's not necessary. You can know, as John says in 1 John 5, Verse 13, I've written these things that you might know that you have eternal life. 
Now, our confession is very careful to make a distinction that, that having eternal life and having assurance of eternal life may are different things. The assurance of grace and salvation. Some people may wait a while after they've been converted to have full assurance of faith. But John says it can be known. I've written this letter so that you may know that you have eternal life. So I ask you, do you know today that the Lord is my shepherd? He makes me lie down in green pastures. One of the pictures that is drawn on here, David knowing this, is that sheep sometimes must be made to rest. The picture of green pastures is interesting here because in, in the uh, arid desert area where David shepherded, you wouldn't always stumble upon green grass. You had to sometimes cultivate green grass, but you had to look for it as well. There would be brown grass, dry patches. The Lord is careful to lead us into green pastures. The picture here, uh, many commentators think, is, is that he takes us into his word. He takes us to feed us and enrich us on his word. That takes cultivation, I would say, as we're speaking to under shepherds here, be sure you're feeding your people the rich greenness of the word. Don't get tired, pastors. Don't think you've arrived. Uh, I don't know about other people, but I do not. When I, when I preach on a passage, and I find out from my wife, I preached on this passage three years ago. I go back and plow it again. I go and study the scripture again. I need, to, I need to see it again. I need to see it fresh. We're not battling COVID now. But we have our battles. We have our concerns. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He's not sparing. He's not stingy. He's not a God who says, they'll just get by on what they get by on. No. We are lavished by our God. The scripture is there. Feed upon the word. Feed upon the word. Hide it in your heart. The psalmist says he does that. That he might not sin against God. Uh, Don Whitney in his excellent book, Spiritual Discipline for the Christian Life, uh, has a lot to say about Bible intake. If you've not read that book, I commend it to you. Bible intake. That's, that's more than just reading my verse for the morning. That's more than keeping up with my daily Bible reading. It's good to do that, but, but do, you, do you digest? Do you chew? Chew. And the word ruminate. Do you ruminate upon the word? Does it strengthen you? Does it sustain you? The Lord, who is our shepherd, David says, when we are not willing to go to green pastures and lie down and eat, he'll make us lie down. I think one of the pictures we have here is, uh, is living life on God's timetable. The Lord loves us so much that he, he, in ordering time, has set aside one day in seven for you to gather with the people of God. And it grieves me how, how pe the attitude of some people, maybe not people here. I look forward to seeing you Sunday if something better doesn't come along. The answer is nothing better ever comes along than gathering with the people of God. Doesn't matter what you're facing. God has a cycle. Walt Chantry in his excellent book called The Sabbath of the Light makes the assertion most of the problems we have societally, most of the, of the mental issues we have, psychological issues, he believes trace to society's intentional failure to honor the Sabbath, to come and rest in a cycle. Rest. God knows what we need. He has set up a cycle where we can lie down in green pastures under the teaching and preaching of the word uh, at least one day out of seven. We should be feeding every day to be sure, but one day out of seven you should gather. We talked last night about a good church. I can't emphasize enough finding a church where the pastor takes seriously opening the word of God and ministering to the people of God. There's enough entertainers, much better than we are. We're not good entertainers. Uh, now, a lot of people can give you and analyze the news of the day. 
the goings and comings, the happenings, the movements. We, as under shepherds, are called to open the word. As Jesus said just before his ascension, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Faithful under shepherds know that we're to lead, feed, and protect. And so, so David teaching us here says, the Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. He goes on to say, he leads me beside still waters. You'll read commentators have different, different ideas about this, but the, but the point I think is there is nothing the Lord leaves out of what we need. Sheep need to graze in green pastures. Sheep need to drink beside still waters. And you, you'll read some people will say that the sheep uh, are very uncomfortable around moving water. Uh, you read some stories that tell you that, in fact, a, a sheep who's taken to moving water will stand and almost get dizzy and fall in if the, if the water's moving. They like still waters, the clear, fresh, pure, living waters. He leads me. So he does these two things. Makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside the still waters. You can make of that, as some people do, the, the idea of the Word of God, the green pastures, the Spirit of God, the living water of the Spirit. But the point is, the Lord provides everything we need. If we follow Him, we'll never be at a loss to grow. It's when we wander off. It's when we ignore His leading and guiding, and David's going to address that shortly. We get into trouble. So I ask you, is that how you're following Jesus Christ today? Are you taking advantage of the opportunity he presents to you to, to feed upon the green pastures of the word? To be strengthened and nourished, to grow? Are you following him beside the still waters? Notice the, the, these pronouns here. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want the first person. He does this. He leads me. He makes me lie down. He's going to do this several times. And then he's going to change the pronoun. <coughs> Is he leading you? Are you following him? Philip Keller in his book again says that sheep will not lie down easily unless four conditions are met. He says because they are timid, they will not lie down if they are afraid. In this analogy, people who come under the ministry of the word and our churches should know that they're in a safe place. I think it means something to a, to a wife and mother to know that she's coming into a church that will practice corrective church discipline. That will not let her husband continue to be unkind to her, but will rebuke him, will correct him, will bring whatever legitimate biblical means of discipline are available to bring him in line. To know the children in a safe place that we take the steps necessary to make it so. He says, though, because they're social animals, they will not lie down if there is friction among the sheep. He goes into great detail about how an older you will sometimes just obnoxiously push aside a younger you. How you have to, as a shepherd, keep that from happening. Well, pastors have to deal with sheep who can be difficult. Are we creating an environment that's a safe place for families, a healthy place for families, a safe place for relationships? I really believe when you study the gospel and you, and you distill it, I was challenged by this by a professor in, in seminary in evangelism. He said, what's the one word you could reduce the gospel to? And he says the word reconciliation. That's what it is. Reconciled to God, reconciled to one another. Folks, when we have churches that continue in turmoil and conflict, at some point we need to help them understand that is a practical denial of the gospel. It's a functional denial. If Jews and Gentiles, as Paul talks about in Ephesians, could be saved and brought together into one new man in Christ, and surely, in America, 
white males and females, which make up most of our churches, can find a way to be reconciled in the gospel. When people are fussing and fighting and fuming and, and refuse to get along, I, I'm helping a young pastor in North Carolina right now. It just amazes me. My mentor, R.F. Gates, used to ask the question when he looked at people who were, who were disrupting churches, he said, no, nah. he called me Sir William. Sir William, did that person have to get saved to be that mean? <laughs> or could they have been that mean without salvation? You know what I'm talking about, if you pastor any length of time at all. Sheep will not lie down if there's friction among the sheep. Third, he said, if flies or parasites trouble them, they will not lie down. And I think it's Keller who in his book talks about how the anointing of the head with oil is like a, like a medicinal salve to sheep who are, who are battling that. But there are little things, the little irritants. We need to check them. Finally, he says, if sheep are anxious about food or hungry, they will not lie down. Brothers and sisters, it, we are stand, sinning against God if our people are not fed after they've sat under our ministry. It's a sin against God. It's a crime. It should not happen. And so, making the lie down in green pastures, leading beside the still waters comes as under shepherds are faithful to create a climate where rest is accessible, where fear, friction, flies, and famine are lacking. And he, he continues this theme, he restores my soul. That's kind of a summary of what he says about how the Lord takes care of it. If you're being fed the lush green pastures of the word, if you're being led and fed, allowed to drink the pure water of the word, that's restoring. The word can mean bringing me to repentance and into conversion. It can mean in a bigger context, a renewal of my spirit. If you live long enough, you follow the Lord long enough, you can be disappointed by some of the other people who follow the Lord. It can get discouraging. Difficult providences can come, sometimes overwhelming us. And the tendency is to give up. The tendency may be to turn away. The tendency may be just to, uh, I've met too many people in, in my life in churches who said, no, you know, I've, I've served long enough. I think I'm going to retire now. I'm going to step aside and let somebody else do that. Well, best I can read from the scripture, God's retirement plan is heaven. <laughs> we don't get to retire <laughs> as long as we have breath. I knew a woman at one time who was a quadriplegic. I would visit her in the nursing homes. Agnes King was her name. When I was a young assistant pastor, the first time I went to see her, I thought, how am I going to do this? I'm fresh out of seminary. I'm going to talk to a woman who cannot move. What word of encouragement will I have for her? Well, it turned out, seeing her, I didn't need one. She spent the whole time encouraging me. She'd been longing to meet me. She saw in the bulletin of where I had, our newsletter where I had come. She'd been praying for me ever since. And this woman had a tremendous prayer ministry. And she could not move from her neck down. Let's get it in our heads. Heaven is God's retirement plan. If he's, if he's saved you by grace through faith, he intends for you to live for Christ while you live so that you can say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Is your soul restored? Maybe you're going through a difficult providence. Do you need the restoring power of the gospel? The reminder that Jesus Christ died for you, loved you, paid the ransom price as we just heard about a few minutes ago? What more does he need to do? What more can he say than to you, he said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Have you fled to Jesus for refuge? Because if you have, then your testimony in part should be, yeah, there was a time when I was wandering. But God. There was a time when I had grown weary. About to give up. Wondering what it's for. But God. 
If any of you have parent, parented for any length of time at all, maybe you've had the experience of a child of a prodigal going astray. A temptation then, it happens for any length of time at all. It's taken place in our family for years. Temptation is to give up, move on, cut your losses. That's not the way the Lord operates. He doesn't do that on us. He does not give up on us. And he would not have us give up on anyone that he's placed within the sphere of our influence. He restores my soul. And when, when the Lord hears and answers prayer, I, one of my favorite passages in the, in the Gospels is the paralytic fellow who's, who's dropped right down at the feet of Jesus. His friends heard what Jesus was doing, had confidence that they got their friend to Jesus. That could happen to him too. They tear back the, some of the roof. They disrupt the Bible study going on, drop him right down in front of Jesus. And then the scripture records this. When Jesus saw the faith of his friends, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. Now we're not teaching salvation by proxy here, but there's something to be learned from that. When we have wayward family, friends that have turned away, when Jesus looks at us, does he see us people of faith, knowing that God is able to restore? Karen and I have talked about this several times through the years. What does he see when he looks at our daughter who's gone astray? Does he look at us and see people who've given up? People who are hopeless? Or does he look at us and see people of faith? And will he perhaps look at us and it be noted when he saw the faith of her parents, he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Oh, folks, does the Lord restore your soul? You found yourself in a dry patch, drifting, starving. The Lord will restore your soul if you look to him. The psalmist goes on and tells us, not only does, does he restore us because he feeds us and leads us so well, he leads us in the paths of righteousness, or as you, as you would read in the Hebrew, he leads us in the, in the wagon tracks of righteousness for his name's sake. Sometimes we think on a, on a very low level. What are people going to think of me? What are people going to think of, of you? What are people going to think of this? My question is, what do people think of God? God has his name atta attached to us. His name is attached to this church. The actions, the initiatives, the plans, the purposes, the prayers, the preaching, all ought to be in, in, in the design of we want you to think much of our God. For that, we will deny ourselves. We will think more highly of others. We will follow him where he leads us. In this picture here, the, the paths of his of righteousness for his name's sake, I believe are the, uh, the moral law of God summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. It's the irreducible minimum of following Jesus Christ by faith. You see, he's laid it down. We're not having to wonder, well, where is it? Where do we go? I've pastored long enough for people to, uh, to get mad at me and, uh, and say things like, well, where are we going? You know, if you're a reformer and you come into a church that by and large, like when I, when I went to where I am now 18 years ago, 1,500 members on roll. 1,500. They had an ugly split. They got a new pastor. They threw a 50th anniversary party. They couldn't get more than 350 people there for that. I found through the years, by the way, the only way they can get the huge crowds out in most churches is let them know you're going to fire the pastor. They come out of the woodwork now. Yeah. But here, this big burgeoning number of people. Yet it didn't mean much. So when you come in as a reformer to preach the gospel, to lift up the standard, 
to say, no, there's some things that will not go on here anymore. We're going to follow the Lord. We're going to pursue holiness. Because we know without that, we will not see the Lord. When you start doing that kind of work, that it's necessary to give a credible uh, profession of faith, evidencing repentance uh, and faith in Christ. That you've not got to be, you have to be in what we call uh, not wholehearted, but substantial. Substantial agreement with the doctrines, discipline, and direction of this ministry. If we're going to have unity. People get mad. And they want to go this way. And they want to go that way. And our challenge as pastors is to say, no, this is the way. Stand in the old way, Jeremiah says. And look and see where it is. Where the old paths are. Follow those. And the answer you'll get oftentimes in this generation is we will not follow. But guess what? That's what they told Jeremiah. So it's not, it's not a new answer. It's not like we're, we're dealing with some difficulty folks have never seen. In fact, at this point, it ought to be a predictable answer. We will walk in there. And so when you, when you make that kind of commitment, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. Then it's not, it's not my way. I've had people say to me through the years, you always have to have your way, don't you? I said, well, you know, the truth of the matter is, I've never asked for my way. All I've done is hold a Bible up. And the best I understand this is how the Lord would have us to go and to live and to be. If you have a better understanding, I'm a student. I learn. I'm a curious student. I have lots of questions. So you teach me. And we're going to stay with this book. And I know I'm talking to pastors here who this, you've heard this. I want to talk to you about this matter, preacher, but I want I want to keep the Bible out of it. I tell them, you know, if the Bible's out of it. I've got nothing to say and you've got nothing I want to hear. It's all about the word, the Lord's word, his will, his way, because he is the one who leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's time that churches come back to the basics and stop asking, well, if we do this, if we, if we go through a, a meaningful membership uh, on our role, what will Aunt Sally say? What will so-and-so say? My question is, what is the Lord saying? What's the, what's the rendering of God upon a congregation that has 1,500 members and no more than two or 300 can come at any given time? Now, in fairness, full disclosure, I told this group of people 18 years ago, I said, if I come as your pastor, I've looked at your numbers, one of two things is going to happen. Either the membership is going to drop to the attendance or the attendance is going to ride to the membership. But we won't have this gap. Because this gap calls into question whether or not this is even a church. The scripture knows nothing of inactive members. Non-resident members. He leads us. So the question is, what agenda are we following? Because there are a lot of them out there. Are we following his agenda? Are we making it all about his namesake? We want the glory of God upon this assembly. We want the name of Jesus Christ to mean something upon this assembly. There's a bunch of buildings all over the place that have church on them. But it takes more than something in the name to be sure that we're living according to the will and way and purpose for the namesake of God. His name is on this. Let's be sure that we're in tune with him. And so when he, when he comes to this point, he shifts. Some people will say you have a different allegory going on. Until that time, you have a shepherd and a sheep. But my, my intensification is that the pronoun shifts. And this, to me, demonstrates what John R.W. Stott wrote in his book, Our Guilty Silence. He makes the assertion in that book on evangelism. He says the reason that we don't talk to people more about God, is that we don't worship God. He says, when we worship God, truly worship God, the, the outcome of that is that we are more inclined to witness to people. That you cannot worship God truly without being just boldened 
emboldened to witness. He says it's a cycle though. If you will go witnessing, sharing the gospel with people, it promotes in you a desire to worship God. I think that's what we see here. Up until this time in the psalm, he, he, he. And the more he's talked about God, he cannot help but talk to God. That's what you see happening here. The Lord, my shepherd, I, I lack nothing I need. He makes me lie down. He feeds me. He leads me beside the water. He restores my soul. He leads me in the past. He's laid down the track for me to walk. Like Hebrews said, looking unto Jesus, run the race that's been marked out for you. Looking unto Jesus. And so as he comes to this point, he says, you know, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which is a dark moment in this psalm, the psalm's full, brimming with a, with a confidence, with a contentment. And this is a different tone here. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Now, a couple of things. He's not saying he's walking into death. If you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, sin, death, hell, and the grave have been rendered powerless. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, death, where's your sin? Oh, grave, where's your victory? He mocks it. When Christ comes and dies on the cross and rises again, he has rendered our enemies powerless. He leads captivity captive. We have no reason to fear death. But the valley of the shadow of death can be a place, and if you're familiar with Pilgrim's Progress, you know that, that Christian went through that. It's, a, it's an awesome place. It's a dark place. It's, it's where you've lost perhaps the smiling countenance of God. You're more keenly aware of the, of the fiendish, devilish enemies who are against you. We do have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and sometimes... They intensify against us. And the psalmist says, even when I go there, and as a shepherd, he had been there. He'd led his sheep there, and he would, but he brings them through. You don't leave them there. We don't walk into the valley of the shadow of death. We walk through it. Through it. If you've pastored any length of time at all, you've walked with some of your members through that shadow of death where they have lost a loved one. And now they're grieving and learning to grieve with hope. Uh, as I think Ernie Rassing was the first one I ever heard say this, when people who are in Christ leave this the land of the dying and enter into the land of the living. We've got to shepherd those folks who remain, who grieve. Even though I walk through something like that, what is our response? I will fear no evil. He doesn't say I will experience no evil. Evil's all around us. It encompasses us. The day in which we live, brothers and sisters, count what you're doing here as so counterculture that you're enemies of the state. The day in which we're living counts your pastors preaching and teaching the truth as hate speech. So we're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But our response is because of who is leading us through that, we will fear no evil. Why? He gives a reason. For you are with me. Notice you. Now he's drawn nearer. He's talked about the Lord, affirmed assertively, confidently what the Lord does. This chief shepherd, this great shepherd over his sheep. Now he's talking to the Lord. Have you been there? Lord, I know. You are with me. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, that may be all we have for the moment is the confidence that God is with us. Again, if you've passed any length of time at all and you've seen people who would stand with you in the battle, tell you they'd stay with you in the battle, people assuring you that they're with you, you can count on them, and you look up and they're gone. But the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's with us. Jesus promised 
I'm with you always. He told his disciples before he ascended, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he promises his power. And I'll be with you always. He promises his presence. And he sort of uh, puts parenthesis around us to be sure that we will always live in this life until he takes us home with the promise of his power and the promise of his presence. You are with me. And then he uses this interesting language here, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then you'll read different commentators that debate on what the rod and the staff are. Is it two things? Is it one thing? It's two different words in the Hebrew. But they at least seem to say this. A weapon to protect the sheep from enemies, wolves. And then a weapon to protect the sheep from themselves. I have a tendency, don't we? The, the hook, we think of the crook of the shepherd who will catch the sheep who's going astray and bring him back. Perhaps, perhaps the other end that, where he's moving the sheep along, tapping them, guiding them. But it's a, it's a weapon designed to defend from harm, to protect from yourself, to guide and lead. Get the picture here. David's describing going through this, this dark area. It's the valley of the shadow of death. The comfort of feeling the, the rod of the shepherd. Knowing he's moving. He's directing. In Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, again, he got there and all he could do was put one step in front of another. He could not see where he was going. He had to walk by faith. Our whole life as followers of Jesus Christ is one of walking by faith. But you'll have to admit with me, sometimes it's darker than other times. Sometimes the full light of the presence and glory of God upon us is not there. But we have to walk by faith nonetheless. So it's good to know that as we walk even in the dark places, he's designing for us the way to go and comforting us with these tools. Your rod, your staff. They come from me. So he's he's turned the pronoun now, where he's talking to the Lord. Been talking about him. Talking about him has drawn him to talk to him. Lord, I know you're with me. I don't feel you with me. I don't see the evidence, but I know because of who you are, because of all that you do for me, that you are here with me. I will therefore fear no evil. Walking in the Lord, following the Lord Jesus Christ does not eliminate the presence of evil. In fact, a lot of people misunderstand the whole, whole nature of, of, of salvation. It's, we have been saved. Justification means we have been saved from the penalty of sin. Once and for all, it's done. When you, when you counsel a believer who's saying, I just feel like God's getting even with me. Stop him saying no. You don't understand justification by faith alone, the finished work of Christ alone. God got even with you at Calvary. You are considered not guilty. You're accepted as righteous in His sight only for Jesus Christ's person and work and your faith in Him. That's justification. Sanctification is I am being delivered. If I, if I have been delivered from the guilt of sin, penalty of sin, I am being delivered from the power of sin. It's ongoing. Paul, in Romans 7, gives us one of the best pictures and expressions of how we battle with remaining sin. In justification, you have been delivered from the, from the penalty and the dominion of sin, but not the condition of sin. Paul says in Romans 7, the things that I know I should not be doing, I find myself doing. The things I know I should be doing, I find myself not doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this stinking corpse strapped to my back? That's the sense of the passage there. And he answers it. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. He faces remaining sin. He faces the struggle and the challenge of progressive sanctification going on from glory to glory with the fact that Jesus has paid it all all to him. Of course, in the third, the third uh, scene in that is glorification. 
if I have been paid, uh, delivered from the penalty, if I have, am being delivered from the, from the power, one day I will be delivered from the very presence of sin. And that will be glory indeed. No sinful options. No sinful temptations. No sinful thoughts. No sinful urges. All wiped away in glory. And this salvation is in its threefold movement if you allow that kind of description. So I will fear no evil for the Lord is with us. He's promised to be with us. His rod and his staff are comforting us. And then the image shifts. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What a powerful picture. If you, if you think of it in terms of the shepherd taking care of his sheep, it's a shepherd who has such confidence in his skills that he can feed his sheep when there are wolves on the horizon wanting to, wanting to feed upon his sheep. <clears throat> He's not afraid. And folks, we need to get that picture in our minds. No matter what comes at us, our shepherd, our chief shepherd, our Savior, who lived and died and rose again, has ascended on high and is coming back soon, has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will see us through. Peter asserts this, that we're being, we're being convoyed through to the end. Jesus prayed confidently. I've finished the work you've given me to do. Interesting, interesting study. He was still alive. He was on the cross. He was so confident that what God sent him to do, he was going to do. He spoke as if it had already happened. I've finished the work you've given me to do. He, Jesus spoke in John 6 with confidence. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. I shall lose none, but raise every one of them up at the last day. He's with us. And so he's able, no matter what our providence is, no matter how dark the culture gets, he still feeds his own. Now, if you look at the newspapers, you would think, well, everything is just falling apart and going to hell. Well, I would say a lot is, but not this place, not your churches. The gospel is being preached. People are being saved. People are growing in grace. Families being restored. Children being raised up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He is demonstrating his powerful presence with us and is feeding us lavishly even when our enemies are all around. Even when we preach things that are unpopular to the culture and the culture takes notice for a season and reaches out and threatens us and, and is going to shut us out and shut us down. He's with us. He's with us. We need to remember as we pray that all around the world, while we enjoy the liberties we have so far in this country, our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world are being persecuted, imprisoned, put to death. Does that mean he's not with them? Not at all. It means he's with them all the way to the end. And he takes them to their heavenly home. You see, we have no reason to ex experience ultimate dismay and despair. Because we have a God who prepares a table before us. Even when our enemies look on, he anoints our head with oil. That's the, the picture of blessing. When you're invited into a home in, in the time in which David lived and even in the time Jesus lived, you'd be cared for, be welcomed, shown hospitality. We've already received precious hospitality here. We, we always do when we come into this place. It's a wonderful gift that you as a church give to people. And that's the way it is with our Lord. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. It, the Lord does not dispense grace by the thimbles full. A fellow said one time, I said, well, how are you doing? He said, well, I guess I'm doing pretty well under the circumstances. His response was, what is a follower of Jesus Christ doing under the circumstances? We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. The Lord is always lavishing on us more than we need. That's how the psalm begins. I shall lack nothing that I need. And here's some of the pictures of this. And But now he's speaking to the Lord. You're doing this for me. And I bless your name for this. And my cup is running over. We, we don't operate by grace with thimbles. Grace upon grace. Grace has been lavished on you. John Piper talks about it in his in his book, Future Grace. He says, you know, we can thank, thank God for, for past 
mercies. That's right to do. We can thank God for, for present promises in the scripture that are, that are spoken to us. That's right to do. He said we ought to learn to thank God for future grace. Believing God will be to us all he's promised to be for us in Jesus Christ and what we will yet experience. And we will experience grace in measures we've not known before. Don't let people convince you that the day of great grace is over. It is not. And so it's with this in mind that he comes to the end of his psalm and, he, and this, this confident refrain comes back to it. Surely. He doesn't say hopefully. He doesn't say it'd be nice if. Crossing my fingers that. No. Surely. This is the same kind of confident assertion that Paul can make in Romans 8, 20, for we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. David says, surely, goodness and mercy. Some commentators have identified goodness and mercy as, as God's sheepdog. So if you're going to carry out the theme, then you've got, you've got the shepherd leading and his goodness and mercy are, are behind us, moving us on. One of the Puritans wrote a book entitled, uh, If You Have Heaven, You Must Run For It. And he had this picture in there about, about the hounds of heaven. Sometimes in our journey, we hear them in a distance. And sometimes they're nipping at our heels, but they're all designed to push us on to heaven. Going heavenward. Going heavenward. Surely your goodness and your mercy. Mercy, the word for God's covenant love. Jehovah is our covenant God. He has pledged himself, his own essence, to be true to his covenant promises. He taught our father Abram that when he put him in a deep sleep and he passed between the animals that he had Abram set up, cut in two, and as a smoking posture, he passes between them, those pieces. Saying as much in a covenant, which the word covenant is cut, May this, may I be cut in two if I fail to deliver on my promises to Abram. And he's never failed. And he won't fail. He's never failed you. He's promised. He says, I'll be with you. Always. He says, in Hebrews 13, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have or with things as they are is another way to render that. For we know him who has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we can confidently respond to that. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what men can do to me. Is that your response? Do you have the real sense today that His goodness and His mercy has followed you to this very moment in your life? That your life in Christ is one experience of mercy after another? That His goodness attends it as well? Because He's a good God. And we have these people who know God is good all the time. All the time God is good. That is true. But, but where is that said from? Is that said from some little trite ditty? Or is that spoken from the depths of your heart because you know God's been good to you? If you're saved here today, He's been good to you. And if you're not saved here today, if you've not trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you just, uh, as, as one preacher said, <coughs> A woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment. He said, have you touched the hem of his garment? Or are you just walking with the crowd nearby? There was a whole crowd surrounding Jesus. One woman touched him. Have you touched the Lord? Has he touched you? Is your testimony one of grumbling and griping? Or is your testimony at this very moment in my life? His covenant love has followed me. His banner over me is love. His goodness has been demonstrated to me in ways that I cannot, if, 
and I tried to count my blessings and name them one by one, I couldn't get through them all and I would be shocked to contemplate how the Lord has blessed me. That's David's confidence. Do you have that confidence? That's David's testimony. Do you have that testimony today? His goodness and his mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And then finally, this last expression of a, of a confident contentment. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Spurgeon says of this, he says, I am, as, as a child on earth, I am my father's child right now. I'm living on earth. But when I ascend to heaven, I'll be with the same family, with the same father, in the same house, just upstairs from where I've lived. All the days of my life. The house of the Lord forever. And Spurgeon asked this question, talking about the, my cup running over. Beloved, I'll ask you a new question. How would it be with you if God had filled your cup in proportion to your faith? How much would you have had in your cup? I thank God that he deals with us on the merits of his son and not on my merits. But under God, when I read this, I purpose, oh Lord, look in my cup and find it filled with faith in your wonderful character as our chief shepherd. In the life, death, burial, and resurrection of my precious Savior, the chief shepherd, and help me so live that when I come to die, it can be said, while he lived, he lived in faith. And when he died, he died in faith. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we read this psalm and <laughs> have read it hundreds of times, but we never tire of hearing the wonderful truths that because you are a good God and because you did send Jesus to live and die and rise again for poor sinners that by grace through faith we can call you our God our Father our Shepherd and not be found hypocrites and be filled with hope and joy and peace in believing and who you are for poor sinners. What you have done and are doing for poor sinners. So I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. All of us following the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of us who know him. Following flimsily. Failingly. Fallibly. Following nonetheless. As long as you have put in order everything we need for life and godliness. You have set in motion everything that needs to happen for us to make it to the end. To hear finally, come you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Savior, like a shepherd lead us. Much we need that tender care. Help us to be sheep who follow. Clearly branded by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Marked out as belonging to Him. And may what was said of the heroes of the faith in Hebrews be said of us. God was not ashamed to be called their God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.